Hey, this is LGBTQ and A. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is a show where we get to know different members of the LGBTQ community. Today, I'm talking with Jennifer Finney Boyland. She is the author of 15 books and also serves as the co chair at GLAD on the board. Stay tuned. Jenny, welcome to the show. Hey, Jeff. Hey, I'm excited to chat. Oh, good. Well, I'm excited to be <laughs> chatted at. Let's make it happen. Okay, I'll chat at you now. Uh, no, I was thinking about She's Not There, which was one of your first books, but it was yeah. the biggest one to put you on the map. Is that right? Put me on the map. Put yeah. you on the map. I was lost before uh, that. <laughs> and here you are now. Still lost. Uh, what was that path? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was thinking about that came out in 2003. Yeah, 03. Uh, so much has changed since then. Uh, I mean, we still have a lot of work to do, but I imagine that as like short as that time ago, you were still defining what transgender meant to people. Yeah, a, a big thing that happened with that book was that I, um, and also in my experience leading up to the time when I was writing the book, is that when I came out as trans, I, I really um, had to kind of explain to people what I was talking about. And I remember people saying, so wait, transgender, does that mean you're like super gay? Which I used to, you know, I get all cross and angry and like, no, 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 but now I'm like, yes, I am super gay. That's it. It's like my, you know, my, I have superpowers. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, I did feel this compulsion or this obligation, I should say, to um, explain, to bring in um, and to some degree to defend. And um, so that was 15 years ago. And now uh, my experience is very different um, that. Um, when I speak to people, often they are, they are already familiar with with transgender issues. In a in a even even the you know the most kind of um, uh, uninformed audience still has a vague sense uh, of what what transgender might might mean. Um, and sometimes I go to places where people are quite sophisticated, and um, so it, it can be a challenge actually when I speak to different audiences. If I have both a group of seventy year old people and a group of 15 year olds or 20 year olds in the audience it's hard to know where exactly to pitch it because um i don't want to i don't want to lose people but i also don't want to leave you know i don't want to leave people behind either yeah so when you're talking to a group like that where do you pitch it do you just like shoot for the older people or well i try middle? to get people onto the highest critical ground as quickly as possible i will say that kind of straight up transgender 101 i i don't do quite so much anymore in a way because we don't need it at least in the same way and also because um, well here's the challenge I mean to s w transgender 101 meaning describing the different ways there are of being trans or the different things that we are talking about when we talk about trans identities which is actually a pretty wide family of um, uh, of issues with people when, when people are dealing with gender um, so it used to be that I would very carefully parse the difference between um, transsexuality, to use a word which we don't actually even use so much anymore, but transsexuality, um, cross-dressing, uh, drag, um, uh, you know, genderqueer, gender non-conforming. Uh, you know, I would I would kind of walk pe intersex even. I would walk people through all those identities and explain how they're different from each other. And there's still, I believe, some value in people understanding the differences between those things because, you know, people are. Um, traveling on their journeys, f what following the the light of different stars. So it it's I think to some degree it can be helpful if you want to know someone if you want to know where they're going. But um, when I when I speak to people now, in some ways, I mean I want people to know as much as they can about the community. But the most important thing they need to know is maybe not the differences between all of us, but the fact that. Um, the main thing you can do is open your heart. Just open your heart. And if you don't know the difference between um, someone who's identifying as a crossdresser and someone who's identifying as what a, a, a transsexual woman, if, if, if you if you don't know the difference between those two things, that's still okay. It, what matters more is that you approach them with love and with kindness and curiosity, and that you you know a deep dive into their sexual and gender identities might not even need to be the first thing out of your mouth when, yeah. you, when you befriend them. Yeah, I, I, I like the way you phrase that because I've, I find that people who want to be respectful 
are really scared of making mistakes and they're just overly careful and that causes them stress. And so I often try to prod them along and say, it's okay, but like, you know, continue the conversation, come from a good place. And also I think like you, it's okay for you to read up on these things. Yeah. Also, I mean, I, I increasingly, and this is not only as my, in my experience as a writer, um, there is that, that classic creative writing, uh, uh, message, you know, show, don't tell. So sure, I can tell you about all kinds of identities and I can I can explain my journey, to use that word we, we now overuse uh, too much. But more important is the showing. You know, you want to know about my life, look at me. Um, this is how I live in the world. This is how I, um, this is how I am human. And y you know, you may not need to know everything about my chromosomes or what drugs I took or you know if I had my nose fixed like you know I mean, we can get to that no and no this is my nose I'll have you, I'll have you. <laughs> <laughs> well the interview's over <laughs> we found out <laughs> yeah I don't think anyone would pay to have this nose but I mean who knows maybe someone maybe it's called a, you know the full boiling so you know <laughs> I just think that w when you 15 years ago we were talking about in 2003 you were on the Oprah show you were talking in very big outlets and it was okay. so vital and important for people to see uh i you know the word normal is you know people have I issues know. with but if it doesn't offend you i want to call you normal you're, you're you're a professor you're a wife you're a mother yeah well and and in some ways um every once in a while when i speak to those audiences i was describing earlier i'll i'll have a group of um fairly kind of self um identifying radical people um, uh, in the in the in the front row, who I can see kind of going. In fact, one time a group of people, I could hear them sighing audibly as I told my adorable little stories of how we should all love each other and how I was raising my family and in uh, you know, and you know I, I could hear people you know, um, especially I think at an earlier stage in my career I think non-binary people um, found um, didn't find much use in my kind of. Um, in what seemed like, um, uh, you know, uh, embracing a so-called normal identity. Um, but um, now, I mean, I kind of want to say, well, look, I tell you what, I'm still doing this work almost 20 years later, and in that time I have raised two sons in rural Maine in a conservative town. I've been married now for almost 30 years to the same woman, um, 12 years as husband and wife, almost 18 years as wife and wife. And I think in some ways there's nothing more radical than raising a family. Um, I mean, depending on how you raise the family. But, um, and I, and, and um, you know, going in and doing your work and, um, uh, you know, it's, again, it's that showing rather than the telling. Now, believe me, as this program makes clear, telling has a place too. But some t somebody said to me one time, the most important thing I did on that Oprah show the first I was on that show a bunch of times, but the first time I was on that show um, was I sat there in my Ellen Tracy suit and um, was relatively calm and relatively funny and sudden because I because I th I think the thing is people used to think that transgender experience, well and gay experience for that matter, but certainly transgender experience was from some far off place from from you know from the planet Jupiter um, and. Um, it is, and and if uh, people, including people like my dear friend Kate Bornstein, who identify as outlaws, I love that. I say, be the outlaw that your heart demands that you be. But it's also okay if you have other more important things to do with your life than, than being trans or gay, uh, or bi, twenty four hours a day. You know, if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna be a parent, if you wanna be a teacher, if you if you wanna. Um, run a, a, a television show that's what she should do and then and and because because we do everything as gay people we do everything as trans people and so our identities as queer people is is not about um how we have sex or what our bodies are shaped like our identities as queer people are about how we breathe the air how we drink the water how we laugh from the bottom of our hearts um, and cry big fat tears sometimes too. Those are it's those are the ways in which we are human. And um, so when we talk about gay experience, we're not talking about how people have sex. We're talking about 
um, you know, every every breath you take from the moment you get up to when you go to sleep. Yeah, I, I feel deeply obligated to to give back the community, to create for the community, to do service work for the community, etc. And I feel that need to give those hours because I think that the harder job is actually what I discussed with my friends, like being in Maine and being like the only one. Yeah, although as I've learned now, I'm not the only one. Uh, and and um, uh, this, so I left Colby. I now teach at Barnard College, which is um, part of Columbia University in New York City. But I worked at um, Barnard at um, excuse me at Colby College in Maine for 25 years, and uh, I love teaching there. Um, and I'm and, and I'm but I'm happy to have my new gig. But um, uh, at a certain point, I got an opportunity to, to do something else. So now I'm doing something else. But so they replaced me at. Colby College. When I left, they hired you know a new person. Um, they hired a young woman, uh, uh, another you know another English teacher, and uh, they took my um, my old office. And the summer after I left, the person came out as trans. <laughs> <laughs> and now he and now he is like you know uh, a trans trans professor at Colby College. I'm like, geez, you think it's something in the air? Is it, is it like the water fountain down the hall? What's, what's the deal? So, um, uh, th there are more and more, I mean, I think there are thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of us across the country and in, in little places like Maine and Cheyenne, Wyoming and, and, uh, um, and Olympia, Washington, where I'll be tomorrow, tomorrow. But, um, What's different is that now people can come out. Now people can be visible and be known. And to a certain extent, that makes it easier. Um, although I should also, you know, to go over to the dark side, I should also say that, that with increased visibility also comes increased blowback, increased resistance, and in some cases, increased violence. Um, and and in, increased um, legislation against us by people who who used to give us a pass because they didn't know that they were supposed to hate us because they didn't know we existed so now it, isn't now, that a necessary hump though yeah i guess it's the although i kind of like the idea of a necessary hump let's just <laughs> parse that phrase but um yeah i think well we used to get away i used to get away with a lot of things because i was just under the radar you know like um you know, I, I went to the the, um, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles in Maine, and just you know, told them, "Oh, would you look? Would you look at this? They put an M on my driver's license when they should have put an F." And the person behind the, you know, the window was like, "Ha ha! Oh, that's so funny, Miss Boylan. We'll fix that for you right away." And and you know, and I, no one asked to see a birth certificate. No one asked to see you know a, a contract from you know from from a lawyer. I, I was like. Ooh, would you look at that funny thing? Okay, we'll fix that. So, um, so now there's a whole process, and so now, now, in fact, I couldn't do that. Now there are uh, there are rules. I mean, the rules aren't at least in Maine aren't too bad, but um, um, so yeah, it is a necessary process. Um, I'm I'm sorry that um, the the blowback generally doesn't fall upon me and on you know white ladies of privilege. Uh, from New England, um, the the blowback falls upon people of color and women of color in particular uh, in the transgender community, um, not only but particularly people who are doing sex work. Um, s some people who want to do sex work and other people who have to because that's um, kind of the only way to um, keep the lights on while you're trying to figure out what to do with your life and how to how to get from where you are to where you want to be, and it, and it costs a lot of people their lives. So um, that's another thing that's changed from 2003 is that I'm, uh, I'm I mean I'm not I'm not, I would never speak for um, someone else, but I try to honor uh, the experience of, of of people who aren't me, and and, and in particularly to um, shout out to um, people who are really at risk. I mean, in this new world that we're in, we're all we're all at risk, um, but. Um, Transgender women of color are in, are um, at uh, are at particular risk, and um, and we need to change that. Um, and um, so, to the extent that I can be a positive force for that, both as a person who's visible, as a person who is trying to lead Glad um, and other um, LGBT nonprofits to um, to help educate people in this country, so that people can live their lives without fear. And they can know that the law 
protects them too. Yeah, and, and, and with your visibility you mentioned, did, was that your plan all along? My plan. Your secret plan, <laughs> like open the plan. No, um, my plan was to do one memoir, to do She's Not There, and then to go back to writing novels because um, I figured, um, I used to I used to say to people, you know, I'm not an activist, you know, I'm I'm just an English teacher, and what I, I mean, sometimes I even still say that, but what I've learned is that English teacher means activist, or that, excuse me, that to be, that there are a lot of different ways of being an activist, and one of them is by telling stories. Um, that that's the thing that brought me to Glad in particular, because Glad is Glad does not do legislation, Glad does not do policy. Glad works through the media. Glad um, accelerates acceptance uh, by uh, trying to um, make sure that our stories are told properly in film, on TV, in print, um, uh, in the digital space. And so, as a storyteller, I thought, okay, there's a place. There's a place I could I could do something good. Um, I've been part of Glad for seven years now. I'm in my final year on that board, um, and things have changed at Glad too. Um, not only in terms of the work we do, which is increasingly focused on um, transgender work. It's about, last time I checked, it was about 40% of our work was in terms of trans advocacy. But um, That's a big change for them as well. Um, it's, it's less of a change than, than you'd think, because we were always doing this work. Um, our longest serving employee is uh, Nick Adams, who, who is a trans guy here in L.A., who um, ha it has, is now the, you know, the director of our trans studio. Transgedia, transgender media desk, um, but uh, yeah. So, but I think we're more visible about the work we're doing. We're more, um, it, 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 we we put it front and center now. And um, I've also tried to transify the board, um, and and to some extent the staff. Although I, I don't hire the staff, but um, our board of uh, twenty five people is I think five or six transgender people right now. Um, uh, Including, there's a farmer. There's an orange farmer from uh, from Florida now on the board. A trans guy, uh, was the first transgender guy. And when I introduced him at the um, at, at his first board meeting, I said, "Well, finally, Glad has a demographic on the board. I have long been hoping to include." And by that, of course, I mean farmers. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, Glad's doing Glad's doing good work. I'm really proud of them. They're growing and growing. They're, we're about to launch a new project called the Glad Institute, which will be um, uh, which will train people and uh, well, it'll be an educational institute, but it'll, it'll specifically train people to do the work that we do, um, so that you can you can so you don't need Glad to do the work. You can you can have Glad show you how to do the work, and you can do that in your hometown. Um, so all that's ahead. Huge. And this is your last year as the co-chair of the board. Will you stay on the board though? Um, I'm I'm uh, I I have to term off um, um, in uh, early early next year. Um, but I'll come. I'll always be part of Glad. I might be part of the institute as well. I might be teaching there. Great. So we'll see. I, I, so I asked about your visibility and as if it was a choice earlier, because for a lot of people in America, you were the first person they saw who was transgender on TV when it wasn't sensational. You know, it wasn't on Jerry Springer, and. Uh, I was thinking back to Rosa Parks, and she. <laughs> this makes sense, I promise. But no, also, <laughs> well, you're, if you're comparing me to her, I'm a little flabbergasted. <laughs> um, uh, to her story, because when I learned of Rosa Parks, she was this cute older lady that was sitting on the bus, and she just really wanted to sit down in the front. And then only later, I don't know if I missed this in school, did I find out that this was part of the plan all along, and she was actually like the second person, but the first one, you know, we don't is not as famous, and mm. this was part of the movement to have this woman, and we elected like Rosa Parks to be the one to do that. And you were making a lot of rounds. She's Not There was the first uh, book by a trans author in the country to hit the um, New York Times bestsellers list. I didn't know if that was a choice to make it Jennifer Finney Boylan, or if it was an accident. Um, it was an accident. The the um. Uh, the publisher, in fact, I, I don't think really knew what was going to happen with this book. It was certainly not the book that Random House expected to, to be, be a bestseller. Um, and um, I will say that um, being on the Oprah Winfrey show helped a lot. Um, the fact that halfway through the, the show, Oprah s decided to make it two shows, um, that helped a lot. Um, uh, it helps a little bit that I'm an English teacher and I um, I know, I mean, I know how to teach a class, 
I mean, I know I'm not I'm not the per I'm far from the perfect spokes model for for our people, but I I do know. You know, if everything goes just so, I think I can teach a pretty good class. So I just, you know, whenever I get nervous about that role, I, I just pretend I'm teaching a class. But no, it was not a, it was not um, a, a plan. I, if it were a plan, I would have done it differently. Um, but um, uh, the, I was surprised that people wanted to hear me keep talking about these issues, um, because I mean, there there have been other transgender authors. Um, before um, Kate Bornstein's work was groundbreaking in the 90s um, and there were books by by or about other transgender people before um, but I think the fact that my book was um, a book by someone trained as a writer and then it kind of read like a novel I think that's what brought in all the kind of you know Midwestern book club moms um, you know it's she's not there is not the most radical book you're gonna read in the trans canon um, but it is, I hope it's one of the books that's um, written um, well. Uh, and that, um, it was funny, there was, a, there was a BuzzFeed article a few years ago that had like a list, the, there was like a, a listicle of trans memoirs. And the good news is that She's Not There was number, the number one memoir. But the, I don't know if this is the bad news, but the, the little tag afterwards said, this is the book to give your mom. <laughs> And, and to the extent that it was a, not a plan, I can tell you that um, she's not there. And a lot of my writing is not aimed primarily at a trans audience or even at a, at a queer audience. It was aimed, um, it was aimed at you know my mother's bridge club. It was aimed at um, uh, moms who are concerned, but who um, moms who are maybe uncomfortable with with talking about. Um, LGBTQ issues, at least at least they were, and in, in up until the '90s, um, but who want to do well by their children and who are moved by the story of someone who seems familiar. It, somebody after I was on that first Oprah show, somebody emailed me and said, in fact, I remember she was from Omaha, Nebraska. I forget her name, but she said, "Jenny Boylan, the weird thing about you is that you seem almost like a person somebody could know." <laughs> Almost. Well, it, but see, the, the, to me, that's an amazing phrase because that's the thing right there that I think we used to think of transgender people. I said Jupiter before. Wherever it was, it wasn't next door. It wasn't somebody that you could know. Um, and uh, now I'm hoping not only as a result of my work, but as a work of, 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 um, of many people who are now um, living their lives um, openly and um uh, uh, joyfully, um, now there's a lot of people that you could know that are trans and um, and who are and who are trans not the way I'm trans, but the way that they're trans, and that all these different ways of being trans are cool. Yeah, and, and, and could you have uh, anticipated or predicted where we were going in terms of uh, trans people and gender uh, non-binary people and gender non-conforming people? Uh, the thing that that got my attention, I mean, if I if I had to kind of tick off the the the, the turning points. Um, uh, of the last 15 years or 20 years, because I, I came out almost 20 years ago right now, or I came out to my family anyway. Um, uh, so the marriage equality movement was a, was a big um, change, um, and not only because people could get married, which is the, the obvious thing that that movement achieved, but the marriage equality movement also changed the way we, te we, 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 they, the country, um, cis and straight people talk about queer people. And by that I mean this. It used to be that um, if you asked a bunch of straight people, particularly straight guys, um, uh, let's say middle-aged white guys, straight white guys. <laughs> I don't know any. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you asked guys like that about, about gay men, you'd probably get a ha, 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 and a little nasty joke about how gay men have sex. Um, and... Uh, so there was a kind of middle school um, dirty joke approach to talking about queer people, if you were a straight person. Um, and so the conversation was about sex. Um, the marriage equality movement changed the, the discourse to a conversation about love. Because if you, I mean, if you went to my mother's bridge club and said, hey, who here is in favor of butt fucking? Well, one or two ladies might have raised a hesitant hand. But... Um, most of them would have been very embarrassed. Um, if you said, who here is in favor of love? Okay, everybody's hands up. 
everybody has hands off. Because wh- who's, who's going to be against love? Or if you're going to be against love for gay people, you're going to have to explain why gay people don't deserve love. And then you're going to have to do these kind of contortions. So the, the um, uh, marriage equality movement made it possible for the discourse to, to change from sex to love. And believe me, we need a discourse around sex. Um, to, uh, well, anyway, I, I, but we're not gonna, I'm, I won't do a deep dive there now. So that's the first thing that happened is that is that the the conversation the national conversation around queer lives became more dignified and became more um respectful in some ways as a result of talking about love so that's one thing that happened um uh i will leave it for others to say what effect she's not there had on on the movement i know that the book came out right at a moment when the culture was changing a lot of things were in the air um, and Oprah Winfrey, in presenting me for several days as, um, a, to use that word, a fairly normal seeming, seeming, um, uh, y- you know, y- y- then youngish middle aged woman uh, with a family um, and children and and students who appeared to love her, that that was a moment also that changed the conversation because because with transgender people. We didn't used to talk about sex, but we always talked about operations. Operations. Tell me about your operation. Have you had the operation? You know, where did you get your operation? Can you have an orgasm? That's That was the number one question that used to be asked me every time I'd speak anywhere. Can you have an orgasm? I'm like, yeah, I can have an orgasm. Can you write a book? Um, so, uh, so there was that. Um, a, a, another key moment for me was when, um, was it Carmen Carrera? And uh, Laverne Cox were on the Katie Couric show, and she asked about, you know, tell me about your operation. And I think it was Carmen, and certainly Laverne, who said, we're not going to go there. We don't do that. That's not what this is about. Um, and r- there was, and really, and, and I wish that I'd had the courage to do that with Oprah, because Oprah asked me that question, and I was like, you know, yes, I have a vagina. And Oprah began singing to me. Uh, well, check the tape. She sang, yes, she has a vagina. And I was, I sat there. Really? She sang that, yeah. And and I said, actually, what you mean to say is, yes, we have no bananas. Ha, ha, ha. So I made a little, I made a little joke back to her. And I kind of sat there and took it. But, you know, later I, I was, I remember I was on the plane going home thinking, that's not cool to, to say that. But then there was, there was no sense of anybody pushing back. And I didn't, and I guess I was not, um courageous enough to to push back i also i was i you know i was a little intimidated by oprah so i didn't do that but later but later carmen and laverne did and that was a huge moment and now people know that you have a transgender person on your on your show or or your tv show or whatever that that's not what the conversation is going to be about and and people had a lot of questions just about the definition of transgender and so they're navigating that and that is what i find with non-binary people and gender non-conforming people today uh, we had Asia Kate Dillon on the show. Oh. They're the first uh, non-binary actor on TV. Yeah. And we we only had them for 25 minutes, and we spent about 20 minutes talking about their gender. Yeah. You know? And uh, and that kind of killed me because it negates their ma- amazing accomplishments. Yeah. But it's just where we are today, I feel like, also. Well, I would say that as much as my heart um, wraps right around non-binary people, I also have to um, accept the fact that that's not my identity. And so... It's, you know, um, we should be having non-binary people tell their stories. We don't want, you know, we shouldn't be having Jenny Boylan explain the lives of people whose experience of gender is really different from mine. Um, I'm a fairly binary person in in some, in in most ways, actually. Um, uh, And, um, uh, and that's, and that's, and that's a good thing, too. But I I feel like... um, yeah, there's just so many ways of be, of being trans. Um, but if if someone tells me that they want, you know, what their pronouns are or what their name is, like I'm gonna call them their name that by by that name and those pronouns, and I I kind of don't want to know a, a whole big thing about their theory of gender because because I mean on on the one hand. Um, on the one hand, how incredibly cool that, that we're at a place now where you can say, here's, wh- here's how 
my experience of the world and my experience of my body and my psyche is going to translate into my human experience before you and this is the way the language is going to reflect that okay so we can we can do a whole deep dive on the other hand it's boring and i don't want to i don't want to know i don't i mean y you want me to call you you want me to call you this name and this pronoun great so now let's talk about the red Sox, you know <laughs> or or let's talk about the grateful dead um, to pick to pick two top two topics that everyone wants to talk about, you know, with you, <laughs> <laughs> the grateful who? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's just it's just, um, um, you know, I, I'm on Twitter a lot, of course, uh, and um, frequently, particularly when I when when I do something that gets me in front of the um, the, the the headlights of the right wing media which is more often than you'd think, I, I get these trolls who start taking me down and who are want to, and want to say, you know, um, who say, actually, we should say him with you or, you know, your name is, and then they'll use my, my, my name of 20 years ago. Are they Googling and, you to find that out? I don't know what they're doing, but, but what I quickly say is, okay, um, what's, what's your name for the president after Nixon? And they'll be like, well, President Ford. I'm like, well, actually, but Gerald Ford is a name he made up. His his actually his birth name was Leslie King, but we all call him Gerald Ford. You know that's and, a fun and, fact. So well, I mean, you know Harry S. Truman, S doesn't stand for anything. It, it just you wanted a middle initial, so he has a middle initial. So we call people. I mean, what's what's the the guy the Edge, in is it you two? Oh yeah, yeah. the Edge. The base wasn't the bass player the Edge. Yeah, he has a real name, but we call him the Edge. You know, because because that's you know. So, you know, I, I'm gonna call him the Edge because I say, "What's your name?" I'm the Edge. Okay, you're the Edge. Fantastic. You know, I'm gonna call. And that doesn't cause you any stress. I'm gonna call Cher. Cher. I don't even know what her last name is actually anymore. Um, I have no idea. Does it matter? No. Roseanne. You know, I'm gonna call you your name. So, how hard is this to do? I mean, I can give you a whole big. We can have a whole deep dive conversation about non-binary gender, and we need to have that conversation because, because it's great. Because it's a thing we should celebrate. But you know what? Um, we should get out of the business of defending ourselves and explaining ourselves. If people say, and this is the thing that happens to me all the time now, that that um, you know every. Um, about every six weeks, um, the Times or the Post or the Times of London, or maybe on the Bill Maher show, there's some there's some person who comes out, Milo, what's his name, come out and they had this thing about how transgender people aren't who they say they are, or oh, I think transgender children deserve to be laughed at, ha ha ha, and and, and people will ask me to provide the defense, to provide the counter, and I'm now like, you know what, my my counter is my counter is look at me, look at my life. This you want to know how I refute you? I refute you by living every day according to what's in my heart and according to the um, you know the the um, the stars by which I pilot my boat. Um, and and I'm not here to have an argument about my own humanity. I'm not here to even participate in an argument about my humanity, which I might actually win or lose. Right? Um, I mean, I'm happy to to talk about all this stuff. Obviously, um, it's it's interesting. But nobody should have to take part in a conversation in which their sense of self is um, something that they have to defend. Right. And that, that's whether you're non-binary or binary or 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 mortal or immortal. Everyone should. We should. People should get to be themselves. Period. Yes. Uh, I, I want to go back for a second. You said something really interesting that the in terms of the gay and lesbian movement, it really ramped up when we rebranded and mm. talked about love. Mm marketing mm. right now in terms of the trans movement we can whatever, we can argue if that's happening or not the trans movement gender identity isn't sexy in terms of marketing yeah i i wrote a piece for the los angeles times a couple of years ago in which i was trying to say we we should be be kind of getting behind identity as um uh as um as the bridge in fact because on the surface of it i Identity. Someone not feeling at home in their body. Someone not being who they are. Um, this is a thing that people who are cis or straight um, s supposedly struggle with. Like, really, you 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 were born in that body, and, and you, but you felt like I mean, I can't imagine what that's like. And because people can't imagine it, they assume it must not exist. So, the the thing is, though, 
everybody knows what it's like not quite to be yourself to have something that stands between you and the person you hope to become um, and whether it's a fear you have to conquer or a test you have to pass or a way of seeing the world or being in the world that's different from where you are now um, I think the experience of, of not quite being yourself of not having an authentic identity is is universal or nearly universal and the only people who don't suffer from this are people who have never examined their own lives um, and uh, I mean I know there are such people but um, do you think that identity is the word I don't it doesn't sound you said you said that sexy. sexy it doesn't yeah. do you have a word I don't I'm seeking it out though me too <laughs> I will um, call you when I find it well uh, we, we but I mean we, that we very do seriously have to find that. because because we talked about love sudden I mean that's all it took yeah. To suddenly for people to open their hearts. And so um, you can say, be, your, be yourself, being, human being, being human. We need, I mean, it's... I kind of like that. How, how hard is it to understand that um, we're all trying to become ourselves? And if you don't, if you don't understand how, how somebody else is struggling to become themselves, just open your heart. You don't need to know, like I said before, you don't need to know the difference between intersex and gender non-conforming. Yeah. I mean, it's nice if you do, but if you don't, just, just, just open your heart. Be nice. And I think that... Just be nice. <laughs> just be nice. <laughs> I think that, like, it's going to have to be as simple as, I just want to be myself, you know? I, uh, I just think that many people in America hear the term gender identity and they're like, that means nothing to me. Yeah. Or they're, or they're like, uh-oh, they're coming for my guns. <laughs> you know, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think we're gonna solve that issue now, but uh, let me know when you decide because I think you're gonna get there faster than I will. Well, th this is this is an important conversation we're having actually because um, so much depends on this, and it's it's a thing I write about in Long Black Veil, the new novel. It's a thing I wrote about in the in um in the t in I had a piece in the Times last summer, um, a, a concept that the philosopher Edmund Burke, I promise you this is not boring, the philosopher Edmund I haven't Burke been bored yet. called moral imagination. Moral imagination means the ability to imagine the life of somebody who is not you. So, and I um, experienced this last year when um, on, in one day, as a result of an accident, I lost um, about three quarters of my hearing. Like one day, um, a thing happened. In fact, the fire alarm in my apartment went off really close to my ears, and when it when it was off, I was three quarters deaf. And so, since that time, I've been um, struggling to adopt to um, a very changed way of being in the world. And it used to be, it wasn't that I didn't understand that people are deaf, um, uh, and it wasn't that my heart didn't go out to people who are deaf. But now that I am three quarters one of them. Um, it's a very different experience and I want to and I and but you shouldn't have to lose your hearing to have compassion for people who are deaf you shouldn't have to be trans or to have a child who's trans in order to have compassion for someone who's trans you shouldn't have to be black or Asian or white for that matter um, in order to have compassion for somebody who is not you so how do we compel people to imagine the lives of others um, anyway like I said that's that particular complaint and prayer is all over Long Black Veil the new novel it is I really liked it it's a thriller but it's also very funny I have to say oh I'm glad you think so your wit is all over it I am sneaky that way yeah it's also at Lord of the Rings oh my god <laughs> I, actually there's a there's a there's a thing toward the end um, where the character um, there is a trans character I don't want to give too much away um, there is a trans character, one of one of the six major characters um, wh whom whom we meet as um, twenty two year olds at the beginning of the book. Um, later, as a middle aged woman, lo long past transition, um, she's thinking about um, what's happened in in the movement, and 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 obviously she's not too far from me, and she's looking back over the last twenty years, kind of in the way that you and I have been, and thinking about how things have changed. And she's saying that she knows that the world has gotten to be a safer place for transgender people or for some transgender people anyhow. But she said, but I was never that brave. She says, 
I set out to save the Shire, and the Shire has been saved, but not for me. And whenever I read that piece, without any warning, tears just roll down my face. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it's just maybe it's just um, I've got a Frodo thing going on. Yeah. Or Elijah Wood. Or maybe it's because I feel a little bit like, I, if I do identify with that, um, I've never really talked about this before. I guess in some in some ways, I mean, I was glad to be able to be a person who helped change the culture and bring us to this place. But in another way, I feel like how cool would it be to be in the next generation, to be in the generation where things are not quite so hard, where when you came out, you didn't have to explain everything like you just invented the whole thing yourself um uh so when i say the shire has been saved but not for me um and there might be a little creeping self-pity which is perhaps uncalled for because really i am one of the luckiest people that i know um and not only because of what i've been able to do um as a writer and within the movement but also because you know i've been married for 30 years and i have two incredibly cool children um, I have to tell you a story about one of my sons. I, I, I'm afraid the show is going to go, go. We're going to go into extra hours. But here's the thing that happened today. Um, I'm waiting in line to board the plane to Los Angeles, and the phone rings. Um, and I'm like, "What?" And it's my son Zach. He's 23. He's like, "I can't get into the mailbox." I'm like, "And he's in my apartment in New York City. He's staying there this week, while I do this." And I'm like, "Yeah, well, that's because I've got the key. Because I've got the keys." He's like, "Well, I need to get in the mailbox." He's, I'm like, "Well." Why? Well, because the stuff I ordered came. What's the stuff you ordered? You know, all the hot peppers and the hot sauce and the and the and and I'm, and he's got this bet going on with a friend of his where successively each of them is eating hotter and hotter things and making a YouTube vid of it and posting it and then challenging the next one to beat that and top it. So he's got like 10 million BTU scotch bell peppers and and flaming hot sauce and pepper from Yugoslavia and he's gonna he's, his and and that's his plan you know and I'm like well you're gonna have to wait till I come home and he's like but I planned my whole day around this <laughs> so now I'm having this kind of this, this fight with him in the line to board the plane as he's saying um, you know uh, can I? Can we call security to open the mail? I was like, well, I don't think security can open mailboxes. You'd have to ask the post office, and that's you're not really the the legal resident of it. And and he's like, well, and, and so he's mad at me somehow for preventing him from being able to make the video of him eating the hot sauce. And that, my friend, is what it means to be transgender. <laughs> you had you had one line that's really funny. You had one line in the book though that w it was so small. But it just kind of gutted me because it said something along the lines of, I just want to call everybody I've ever met and say I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, I had that feeling early on. Uh, you want to – there's a way of – and I don't know – I don't know if young queer people feel that way now. Uh, oh, really? Because I would have countered with saying that's nothing about being trans. That's about being a human. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to take this out of your court. Yeah, I, think but... you're, I think you're actually – I think you're right. I think that there is just a sense of – um. I, want to I remember yeah. some, in late in his life, someone asked Jerry Garcia, was there anything you regret in his life? And he said something like, yeah, well, not really, except I just wish it all could have been a whole lot more fun. <laughs> and I, I guess I feel that way sometimes. But I, I do... Um, it's... Um, it's, a heavy, it's a heavy burden, the feeling that you've let people down. The feeling that um, somehow... Um, you weren't what they expected um that you know if you if, if i've complicated anyone's life um i'm thinking of my my mother my sister um my wife and to some degree my children and my friends okay well everybody um if i've complicated people's lives um i don't know i i'm just enough of a of a sentimentalist to to feel sorry when but you know I sh why should why should I be sorry? You know, I mean, should I be any sorry for that than than for the fact that I'm three quarters deaf? Um, should I be sorrier that I you know for that than the fact that I had you know cataracts or that I lost a tooth? You know, so I mean, this is what it means to be human. 
Um, and I think it, what st- it stops you probably from telling everybody I'm sorry is the fact that nobody's knocking on your door just to be like, hey, Jenny, by the way, I'm really sorry. And you're like, oh, for what? I forgot about that. And they're right. like, I've been thinking about it for years. Have, have you ever had anyone do that? Do Never. It, um. it, it, it struck me, though, because I feel like every day uh, 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 I wake up and I think this is who Jeff is. This is who I am. I know exactly who I am. And then I just have to wait six months. And I'm like, oh, my God, who was that guy? Oh, old old Jeff. Oh, right. yeah. younger He Jeff. knew nothing. Past Jeff. I'm so wise now and smart. And I just look like a completely different person every six months. Well, this is one of the weird things about having come out uh, as trans uh, at about age 40. So, I've, I've, I mean, I'm just shy of 60 now. So I have, I've had these three phases in my life, really, of 20 years each. I have 20 years of being a child oh, wow. and an adolescent. 20 years of being a youngish man and then 20 years as a woman and um, 20 years is long ago enough now that I can look at pictures of myself as a younger woman and think I'm not that woman anymore in fact I guess I've, I've been maybe three or four different women at this point in my life um, you know early on in transition I was very youthful I was very um, I cared a lot about um, my appearance and being and being sexy and, and my clothes fashion was really important to me Passing was really important to me. Um, uh, cis, uh, um, um, appearing cis, I'm, I'm sorry to say, was probably more important to me than it than it should have been. Um, and then, you know, then I was like a soccer mom, you know. Um, uh, and I don't know what I am now. I'm like an, you know, a, a, a older older stateswoman, maybe. I don't know. Um, but you know, I, I I'm. I'm at the point in my life now where I have a closet that has clothes in it that I haven't worn in a long time, and I look at those clothes and I'm like, "Oh my god, I bought I bought that when I was in in my you know, uh, my L. Uh, Bean phase, you know, oh how embarrassing, you know, or I bought that when I was in doing the G, the J Jill thing, oh, oh, I'm so glad that's over. And um, when you go through transition, like when you first have, for for me. When I had um, clothes in my closet that I wanted, it was such a huge thing. I couldn't believe, oh my God, there's dresses. Look at these dresses. Look at all the dresses. Well, I don't wear dresses anymore, actually, because, I mean, except, you know, the graduation or something, because, you know, I don't know, they're cold or something. Um, maybe if I lived in California, I'd wear more dresses, but, you know, I, I, I just, um, so the thing that at one time in my life was, the symbol of all that I had dreamed and hoped for and had been kept away from me had had now become has now become oh that that old thing I should give that away so it's the um spectacular mystery of life is the way we keep becoming other versions of ourselves and in fact maybe that's the way getting back to this question of identity maybe that's the thing we still didn't have the language for it, but this experience of, you know, I, I had these clothes in my closet, and then I had these clothes, and I had these clothes. Um, that's the thing I think it's that's universal. I remember my sister used to be like all in whenever she'd do a thing. So she was a deadhead in the '70s, then she w- went totally punk in the in the in the late '70s. Um, then she was like uh, kind of country western in the '80s. Then she moved to England, and then she was like a kind of an English country. Um, you know, a housewife for, for, for a while. And then she was a mom, you know, and then she became an academic. Um, and so I always imagine her closet as having, you know, the, you know, it's, it's like archeological layers. The farther back you go, the younger, the younger you, the, the younger version of herself you could find. And that's probably true of everybody, right? Tell me, tell me you don't have something that you um, never wear, but you'll never part with it because that's old Jeff. Absolutely, and I've started the cycle where I started buying things that I would have worn like 12 years ago, but it's now a bigger size. Ah, oh, that's very sneaky. My last uh, purchase, that's my favorite thing about all year, is that all for the last two years I've wanted short overalls that are shorts, just denim overalls, and I finally bought them. Like overalls, like like over oh them, yeah, legit overalls. But they're, sh- but they're short. But, well, well, I bought capris, so I cut them into shorts, and then I rolled them. Um, and they're my favorite thing ever. I like and the way you think. They make me laugh so much, and I love wearing them. You know what makes me laugh? Of course, and this you have to be a, a person who lives in northern northern New England for this, but a union suit, like a which which, which I have, which is bright red, and it does have like buttons on the on the trap door. Yeah, going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and um, 
when I was on the, the Caitlyn Jenner show, um, my probably my closest friend on that show was Kate, um, Candace Kane, who is just the most gorgeous woman and always has the most gorgeous clothes. And I really wanted to bring the union suit one night and just kind of come out of the out of the bathroom and say, "Oh, uh, hi, uh, Candace, how are you?" Um, but I didn't do it because I was afraid, you know. For because for one thing, uh, we know we were in California and it was not really cold enough to justify. But I can tell you that I love that union suit. Oh my god, that is so funny. I, I think those things those things are going to come back in, in style. <laughs> and you're ready. You're ready. People people should wear them on the street. What, now, what's this thing about the jumper? Oh, the male jumper. There was all over Twitter yesterday. I'm what not is, mad at it. What is what is what is the story? It's just um, they. Uh, I, don't, I don't know enough to tell it. To talk if, about if it. we go there, is that the rest of the shorts with a pod? jumper? Yeah, that's section. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's podcast two. Okay, um, all right. It's like over. Back. We're gonna split it too. But uh, it's just I'm not mad at it. Is all I'm gonna say that okay. it exists and that people want to wear it. I think good. It's fantastic. Right, okay, all right. Maybe yeah. I'll buy one. Ten no, year, I vote. Ten years. From I can't now. do it. Yeah, ten years from now. I have to let you go. This was so much fun, though. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to have been here. Thanks. Absolutely. If people want to buy the book, it's called Long Black Veil. It's out now. Also, if they want to find you, so you send to your website, your Twitter. Yeah, well, let's let's send everybody to jenniferboylan.net. Um, that's the website. Also, the Twitter handle, Jenny Boylan. Fantastic. And uh, all over Facebook as well. Fantastic. And I'm on Twitter at JeffMasters1. You can also find all of our interviews on YouTube and iTunes. And if you really want to help us out, tell everyone you know or just five friends. And if you don't have five friends and you have like five enemies, tell them. It'll really screw them over. All right. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye. From executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.